Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at an Astrotech AT72ED, a 72mm F6 ED level refractor. Now as of filming right now, there have been two different versions of this, the Mark I, this is the one I bought back in 2016. This is the newer model introduced a couple of years ago. Now when this thing first came out, they were less than $400, and I bought one mainly out of curiosity, but it's since been a relatively well-used telescope in my collection, and back when I first bought this thing, I started telling everybody to buy this because it was an extraordinary bargain. Now, it's an optical tube only. Both of them weigh about five pounds, so you are going to have to supply your own eyepiece diagonal finder and the all-important mount, but a lot of refractor owners want to supply those things themselves. They get very picky about what they want on them, so you know, the fact that it's an a la carte type optical tube assembly is okay. The Mark II version does have some upgrades mechanically, and we'll take a look at this. This one is now for selling for around $519 or so. Yes, the price has gone up, but you know, given the amount of inflation that's been going on here, that's actually not that bad because when they discontinued this one, it was in the low 400s. This one's about $100 more, factoring in the inflation, still a very good deal. If you want the too long, didn't read version, these are both excellent bargains and they are highly recommended by me even today. But if you're a beginner, I really recommend and hope you'll watch the rest of the video so you don't get tripped up by something you weren't expecting. If you get a Mark I, it comes like this in a nice aluminum case and fitted foam inside. This is quite well made and again at the original asking price of $379, a nice bargain. We have 72 millimeter F6 objective lens with ED style glass on it, very little false color on this. And you'll see that first of all, one of the complaints I have is the dew shield. It uh, kind of a little bit too loose. When I have to go outside, I will get a piece of tape and just tape it here. There is no conventional place to put a finder. So as you can see, I put a Rigel quick finder base on it and I have a bunch of these. You'll see this one says AT72 on it and I'll just put that on there. And the reason I have several of these is because I have these all collimated for the particular scope that I put them on. There are no conventional split mounting rings or mounting plate. Rather there is a foot that is attached and almost molded into the scope body itself. This is a Vixen compatible style plate. That is the correct dimension. However, it is on the short side. So when it is on the short side, sometimes if you have to mount something, you'll just get another plate like this very fine ADM unit. I wish they were all this nice. And you bolt it on the bottom like this. And this gets you where you need to go. But I kind of feel that maybe that mounting foot should have been longer to begin with so that you didn't have to do that. It kind of defeats the purpose when you have to add another plate to the plate that's already there. Have a nice two inch, two speed focuser. And because there are no rings here, sometimes it may not be angled the way you want it to be. So this is a rotating focuser. This is the lock knob here. And I can say that the machining on this is very good. In other words, if you do have to rotate the focuser, it does retain focus. At least this one does. You don't have to refocus. That is a problem with many cheap telescopes. We've got a two inch focuser here with two inch to inch and a quarter adapter. Nice quality on there. And now we come to what's probably my biggest concern here is this focuser. So this looks good from a distance from where you're probably watching it. The action on it is good. I wouldn't say it's great. Getting the correct tension on this so that it's loose enough that you can focus, but that it's strong enough that it's going to hold everything that you put back here, a big heavy diagonal, big heavy eyepiece, and or a camera. There is a slow speed and a coarse speed here. Again, I don't know as if we can really complain here for the money. I think this is a very good bargain. All right, here's the newer Mark II, and as you can see, one big difference right away is they have done away with the case, and that's probably my biggest issue with the Mark II. Um, you know, the case is a nice thing to have. This is a portable travel-type telescope, and it would be nice to have a case to bring it around in. I keep the 
Mark I unit right by the door. And sometimes when I'm running out the door to an event, I'll just grab the case because it happens to be sitting here. And there's been uh, more than one instance when I was really glad I had that with me. It wound up being very useful to me. So I found that when you do have the case, it does make you use the thing a little bit more. And what's odd here is it seems like this foam is really nice. It almost feels as though at one point they did intend to give you the case, but for some reason they decided to delete it at the last moment. All right, so we get the scope here, and on the surface, the spears that have almost nothing in common with the previous version, but it actually is the same. You've got a you know, similar 72 millimeter F6, 430 millimeter focal length, and one thing you'll see they fixed right away is this dew shield is very nice. It will not slip on you. You'll also see that it has the traditional split ring mounting rings and a longer plate underneath. You can see this has been used quite a bit. You can usually tell how much a scope has been used by watching these bite marks. And listening to their customers, there is a conventional finder bracket mounting shoe. But the biggest improvement I'm seeing here is in the focuser. This is so nice. And I don't know if this is coming across on video. Two speed focuser, there is no doubt. The tension is always correct on it. And the quality of this is just much better than the one on the Mark I. So the biggest challenge you're going to have is finding a suitable mount. And I've been running into this a lot lately, but what you'll want to try to avoid is the use of a conventional photographic tripod to mount your telescope. It may look okay, but it doesn't really work all that well. You really do need a telescope-specific mount. But luckily, with something this small, there are a number of options at your disposal. Here's one that isn't mentioned, I think, enough. Teleview sells this telepod. This is the cradle that they use for their Altaz mounts. And the cradle is, has holes drilled into it for Teleview-specific clamshell rings. But there's no reason why you can't adapt a regular plate to this and start using a telescope on it. You may wind up drilling some holes. If you do have a plate like that ADM I showed you before, it has slotted holes in it and it, you can't get that to fit on here. Uh, I really wish manufacturers would slot all of their plates so we don't have to deal with the various mounting systems out there. Yeah, Could you guys get on that please? Thank you. Anyway, you get the telescope on here and it goes up and down and left and right and it's designed to be used with a small telescope, which your photographic tripod is not. Another option is a camera tracker mount like this Skywatcher Star Adventurer. There are a couple of these out there. Ioptron has one and there are others out there as well. But in a pinch, it can double as an equatorial mount. Now, I don't want to oversell that because I don't think an equatorial mount mode, it's all that good. <laughs> this may look fine the way you're looking at it right now, but it's not very convenient. There's no keypad, there are no slow motion controls. I've taken this thing with me all over the world. I like this thing and I don't like it at the same time. I may wind up doing a video on this as well. But the, one of the problems with a photographic tripod is it has the ten tendency to use one screw. And you want to try to avoid solutions that use only one screw to hold your telescope on. And the reason because no matter how much you tighten that screw, it's going to twist, it's going to turn, and I have th seen these things unthread themselves and fall on the ground. We don't want that happening to you. So while this thing does have a Vixen compatible plate on it, when you put this shaft and the counterweight on here, you actually lose the Vixen compatible plate and you only get one quarter inch by 20 screw at the top, which completely ruins the whole idea of this. And in fact, if I have a smaller item on here, like just a camera, I'll just, you don't have to use this. You can take this off. Okay, the other thing you can do is a traditional Altaz mount like this Vixen Porta. This may or may not be available by the time you see this, but there are other versions made by people like Orion, Explorer Scientific, Stellar View, and others. And this is a Vixen compatible plate. It is sideways, so your telescope is going to be sideways. That does confuse some beginners at first, but if you have a rotating focuser, just rotate the focuser. Or if the telescope has rings like this one, you can just turn the rings. Another option here is this go-to mount, like this single-sided swing arm, one-arm bandit style go-to mount. This is my Celestron Nexstar SE. There are others on the market as well. The big thing you want to watch for here is with the telescope clamped in here, 
with the telescope pointed all the way up at the zenith that the back of the scope does not run into the base here. You want to make sure it clears that. If it doesn't, you can always put it on another plate, move the telescope forward so that it clears the base. And the final thing you can do is put it on a equatorial mount like this one with go-to capability. Now you have full capability with tracking and go-to and you can do imaging with it as well. What can you see with a telescope like this? Well, quite a lot. You should have no trouble seeing craters on the moon, the rings of Saturn, Jupiter and its four moons, and two cloud belts. Also, under dark enough skies, you can see dozens of the showpiece objects and perhaps more if you're diligent enough and if your skies are good enough. You can see the Pleiades, the Andromeda Galaxy, the double cluster in Perseus, and the Orion Nebula. All of these, no problem to see these. I saw many of these back the other night. You know, when I did the review of the Teleview Pronto, I pointed out that you could take a 35 millimeter pan optic, a two inch O3 filter, and point the telescope at the Veil Nebula in Cygnus. You can see the entire veil in one view. It's a neat stunt that you can pull. That works with this one also. In fact, this actually has a shorter focal length than the Pronto, so it'll show you slightly more sky. The AT72 is also commonly considered a gateway drug into astrophotography. This is not bad. I've seen some people get some pretty good images with it, and it's a good learning tool. This image of the Horsehead Nebula was the best that I was able to get on this object for a very long time until I upgraded my equipment and my processing techniques. The owner of this AT72 got into astrophotography, and in the couple of years that he's been doing this, he's really progressed quite nicely. Here are some images that he's taken. Okay, so I do get a lot of questions about these models. I'll try to knock some of these down. First one is, what kind of eyepieces should I get? Well, you know, you can do what you want. You can go cheap, you can go expensive, you can go in between. A lot of that is personal preference. If you've been following me, you know my bias on this buy the good stuff right out of the gate. If you buy it once, you don't have to worry about buying it again. The two eyepieces I use the most often were the Teleview 19mm pan optic for low power sweeping and the Teleview 7mm Nagler for getting a little bit closer up. Similar situation with the diagonals. I like to use astrophysics and Teleview diagonals. Yes, they're expensive, but it kind of takes it out of the equation. And again, you only have to buy it once. Is this a good beginner scope? Maybe. <laughs> you could make this work if you wanted to. Put it on a mount, you could learn a lot from it. But there's a reason I keep recommending a 6-inch or 8-inch Dobsonian as the best first telescope. It gathers a lot more light than this thing does. And this thing only gathers 72 millimeters worth of light, so you are going to run out of things to look at. You know, a few years ago, I was showing somebody the Orion Nebula through a Teleview Pronto. That's a sort of an earlier version of one of these. Orion Nebula is one of the biggest and brightest objects in the sky, and she said she couldn't see it. So again, many beginners surprised at how dim things are. So you need early success, you need bright objects, and you need something that gathers a lot of light. So the other thing is, yes, the optical tube is only $500, but by the time you buy the eyepiece, the diagonal, the finder, and the mount, you're going to be well north of $1,000 US. In fact, I would count on it. You start buying higher quality stuff, over $2,000 is not unreasonable. And if you get into imaging, you can double that easily. So if you buy a six or eight inch Dobsonian reflector, you're going to spend you know, whatever, six to $800 and you get everything. So it is something to consider. You can make something like this work, but I would still recommend the bigger reflector as a first starting telescope. Now, if you already have a larger telescope, an eight inch Dobsonian, an eight inch schmidt cassegrain say, these things as a niche make a great second telescope. In fact, if you have something like, uh, you know, say a Nexstar 6 or an 8-inch schmidt cassegrain on an equatorial mount, you're good. I mean, just take the other telescope off and put this one on, just swap optical tubes on the mount, you're good to go. Okay, are the lens caps interchangeable? I've gotten this question a couple of times. I don't know why you would want to know that, but the answer is no, they're not interchangeable. The, Diameter of the dew shield on the older model is actually a little bit too big uh, to fit on the older one, and the newer one is a little bit too small. So, no, that doesn't work. How is the star test? Well, it's okay. It's not all that terrific. Looking at both of these, they are about at the level of the half wave of spherical aberration in Souter's book. That's got to be a little bit of a concern. But you know what? If this was a $2,000 telescope, 
I would be concerned at a $500 telescope, you know, don't worry about it, it's fine. And finally, is the Mark II worth it over the Mark I? I'm going to say yes, and it's not because of the optics. So Astrotech makes a big deal about the fact that the new version has the FPL 53 glass, that is a higher grade glass than what's in the older version. I looked through these, I didn't really see any difference. They look pretty much the same to me. The upgrades in the Mark II that are worth it are mechanical. I appreciated the mounting rings, the plate, the finder shoe, and the better focuser. So yes, I think it's worth it if you can find this. If, however, all you can find is an older version and you're really tight on budget, this is still worth the money. If you can find it at a good price, I'd also still recommend the Mark I. Okay, so there you have it, a look at both versions of the Astrotech AT72. I hope this video has helped you to decide if one of these is right for you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.